there! Let's start with metabolic effects. Cellular metabolism is based primarily on the hydrolysis of adenosine triphosphate or ATP. The splitting of the phosphoanhydride bond of the terminal or gamma phosphate from ATP is the source of energy for most processes within the cell under normal conditions. The majority of ATP is generated in our bodies through aerobic metabolism in the process of oxidative phosphorylation in the mitochondria. This process is dependent on the availability of oxygen as a final electron acceptor in the electron transport chain. As oxygen tension within a cell decreases, there is a decrease in oxidative phosphorylation, and the generation of ATP slows. When oxygen delivery is so severely impaired, such that oxidative phosphorylation cannot be sustained, the state is termed dysoxia. When oxidative phosphorylation is insufficient, the cells shift to an anaerobic metabolism and glycolysis to generate ATP. This occurs via the breakdown of cellular glycogen stores to pyruvate. Although glycolysis is a rapid process, it is not efficient, allowing for the production of only 2 mole of ATP from 1 mole of glucose. This is compared to complete oxidation of 1 mole of glucose that produces 38 mole of ATP. Additionally, under hypoxic conditions, in anaerobic metabolism, pyruvate is converted into like lactate, leading to an intracellular metab metabolic acidosis. There are numerous consequences secondary to these metabolic changes. The depletion of ATP potentially influences all ATP-dependent cellular processes. This includes maintenance of cellular membrane potential, synthesis of enzymes and proteins, cell signaling, and DNA repair mechanisms. Decreased intracellular pH also influences vital cellular functions such as normal enzyme activity, cell membrane ion exchange, and cellular metabolic signaling. These changes will also lead to changes in gene expression within the cell. Furthermore, acidosis leads to changes in the calcium metabolism and calcium signaling. Compounded, these changes may lead to irreversible cell injury and death. Epinephrine and norepinephrine have a profound impact on cellular metabolism. Hepatic glycogenolysis, gluconeogenesis, ketogenesis, skeletal muscle protein breakdown, and adipose tissue lipolysis are increased by catecholamines. Cortisol, glucagon, and ADH also contribute to the catabolism during shock. Epinephrine induces further release of glucagon while inhibiting the pancreatic beta cell release of insulin. The result is a catabolic state with glucose mobilization, hyperglycemia, protein breakdown, negative nitrogen balance, lipolysis, and insulin resistance during shock and injury. The relative underuse of glucose by peripheral tissues preserves it for the glucose-dependent organs such as heart and the brain. Next, cellular hypoperfusion. Cellular hypoperfusion. Hypoperfused cells and tissues experience what has been termed oxygen death. A concept first proposed by Crowell in 1961, the oxygen death is the deficit in tissue oxygenation over time that occurs during shock. When oxygen delivery is limited, oxygen consumption can be inadequate to match the metabolic needs of cellular respiration, creating a deficit in oxygen requirements at the cellular level. The measurements of oxygen deficits uses calculation of the difference between the estimated oxygen demand and the actual value obtained for oxygen consumption. Under normal circumstances, cells can repay the oxygen death during reperfusion. The magnitude of oxygen death correlates with the severity and the duration of hypoperfusion. Surrogate values for measuring oxygen death include base deficit and lactate, defic lactate levels and are discussed later in the hypovolemic or hemorrhagic section. In addition to the induction of changes in cellular metabolic pathways, Shock also induces changes in cellular gene expression. 
the DNA binding activity of a number of nuclear transcription factors is altered by hypoxia and the production, production of oxygen radicals or nitrogen radicals that are produced at the cellular level by shock. Expression of other gene products such as heat shock proteins, vascular endothelial growth factor, inducible nit nitrogen oxide synthase or INOS, heme oxygenase 1 and cytokines also are clearly increased by shock. Many of these shock-induced gene products such as cytokines have the ability to subsequently alter gene expression in specific target cells and tissues. The involvement of multiple pathways emphasizes the complex, integrated, and overlapping nature of the response to shock. Next, immune and inflammatory responses. The inflammatory and immune responses are a complex set of interaction between circulating soluble factors and cells that can arise in response to trauma, infection, ischemia, toxic, and autoimmune stimuli. The processes are well regulated and can be conceptualized as an ongoing surveillance and response system that undergoes a coordinated escalation following injury to heal disrupted tissue or restore host microbe equilibrium, as well as active suppression back to the baseline levels. Failure to adequately control the activation, escalation, or suppression of the inflammatory response can lead to systemic inflammatory response syndrome, or the SEERS, and, the poten and potentiate multiple organ failure. Both the innate and adaptive branches of the immune system work in concert to rapidly respond in a specific and effective manner to challenges that threaten organisms' well-being. Each arm of the immune system has its own set of functions, defined primarily by distinct classes of effector cells and their unique cell membrane receptor families. Alterations in the activity of the innate host immune system can be responsible for both the development of shock, for example, septic shock following severe infection and traumatic shock following tissue injury with hemorrhage, and the pathophysiologic sequ sequelae of shock such as pro-inflammatory changes seen following hypoperfusion. When the predominantly paracrine mediators gain access to the systemic circulation, they can induce variety of metabolic changes that are collectively referred to as host inflammatory response. Understanding of the intricate, redundant, and interrelated pathways that comprise the inflammatory response to shock continues to expand. Despite limited in understanding of how our current therapeutic interventions impact the host response to illness, inappropriate or excessive inflammation appears to be an essential event in the development of ARDS. Multiple organ dysfunction syndrome and post traumatic immunosuppression that can prolong recovery. Following direct tissue injury or infection, there are several mechanisms that lead to the activation of the active inflammatory and immune responses. These include release of bioactive peptides by neurons in response to pain and the release of intracellular molecules by broken cells, such as heat shock proteins, mitochondrial products heparin sulfate, high mobility group, BAX1, and RNA. Only recently has it been realized that the release of intracellular products from damaged and injured cells can have paracrine and endocrine-like effects on distant tissues to activate the inflammatory and immune responses. This hypothesis, which was first proposed by Matt Zinger, is known as danger signaling. Under this novel paradigm of immune function, endogenous molecules are capable of signaling the presence of danger to surrounding cells and tissues. So that is the definition of danger signaling. Again, I will repeat that. Danger signaling. Novel paradigm of immune function, endogenous molecules are capable of signaling the presence of danger to surrounding cells and tissues. These molecules are released from cells are known as damage associated molecular patterns or dumps. Dumps are recognized by cell surface receptors to affect intracellular signaling that primes and amplifies the immune responses. 
These receptors are known as PRRs or the pattern recognition receptors and include toll-like receptors, receptors advanced glycation and products. Interestingly, TLRs and PRRs were first recognized for their role in signaling as part of immune response to the entry of microbes and their secreted products into a normally sterile environment. These bacterial products, including lipopolysaccharide, are known as pathogen-associated molecular pattern or PUMP. The salutary consequences of PRR activation most likely relate to the initiation of repair process and the mobilization of antimicrobial defenses at the site of tissue disruption. However, in the setting of excessive tissue damage, the inflammation itself may lead to further tissue damage, amplifying the response both at the local and systemic level. PRR activation leads to intracellular signaling and release of cellular products including cytokines. Before the recruitment of leukocytes into sites of injury, tissue-based macrophages and mast cells act as a sentinel responders, releasing histamines, eicosanoids, tryptases, and cytokines. Together, these signals amplify the immune response by further activation of neurons and mast cells, as well as increasing expression of adhesion molecules on the endothelium. Furthermore, these mediators cause leukocytes to release platelet activating factor, further increasing the stickiness of the endothelium. Additionally, the coagulation and the kinin cascades impact interaction of endothelium and leukocytes. So that's it for now for this part. I see I will see you on the next video. Thank you.